counterintuitive features of the mathematics in quantum theory come from the fact that we have to change the way we describe a physical system. So far, probably in your undergraduate courses, most of the things you have done is to describe the evolution in time or some static properties of the physical systems. Now we have to say something deeper. How are we going to describe a physical system? Let's go first through the obvious, very simple, classical way of doing it. In classical physics, here's an example, would be the example of a car moving on a road, one dimensional, of course. So the variables of the car are its position and its speed. And now every physical property of this car can be described in terms of these variables. For instance, the red set describes the cars that are exceeding the speed limits, yeah? because the speed is above this limit or below in the other direction. The blue set describes the cars that are east of this line. Now, of course, the cars that are east of the line and exceed the speed limit are in the intersection between the two sets. So all the physical properties in a classical description, in our natural intuitive description, are subsets of a set of properties, of a set of states. In particular, this implies that two properties are distinguishable. They cannot be held at the same time, if and only if the two sets are disjoint. And another important property is that if two sets are not disjoint, like in this example, like in this example, then I can always find a state such that both properties are true. For instance, again here, it is, it is true that the car is east of this line, and it is true that the car is exceeding the speed. Now, when we go to quantum theory, the recipe to describe states is different. The properties are no longer subsets of a set, but subspaces of a vector space. Now, what is the main difference? So here is a vector space, R3, the three dimension at the volume, I try to, to draw in three dimension. And here is one subspace, is for instance this plane. So it describes a property, whatever it is. You can think, it's not exactly like that, but you can think that this blue is the same as here, so this would be the cars that are east of the line. And this property is another, this, sorry, this uh, subspace is another property, something else. Now there is a rule that is, in fact, the first postulate. We'll come back to this. The first postulate of quantum theory is that properties are distinguishable only if they're associated to orthogonal subspaces, like these two. Now, this line is orthogonal to this plane. But now, there's a big difference with, quantum, with classical theory, and it's the following. What about this property? This line is also a one-dimensional subspace. So it will be associated to some property, but it's not orthogonal to this plane, and it's not orthogonal to this line. So it's a different property, but obviously not the same, right? It's a different subspace, but it cannot be perfectly distinguished because it's not orthogonal to either. You will see during this course a lot of these examples. This is, if you want, is the mathematical way that in which we describe the fact, for instance, that position and momentum cannot be measured simultaneously. Okay, this would be, for instance, values of position, and this would be values of momentum in, in a qualitative way. So this is the reason why in quantum theory we are going to use a lot of linear algebra. This is the language that must be mastered in order to do the mathematics and to predict correctly the physical phenomena. So since we are going to have to use a lot of linear algebra, let me summarize very quickly what are the most useful notions? There is a whole chapter in the lecture notes where there is a, a lot of details about these. The first thing to define is, of course, what is the vector space that we are going to use. In quantum theory, it is called, for some reason, the Hilbert space. There are essentially two types of vector space we are going to use. Finite dimensional ones, which are essentially the vectors with d complex components. d can be 2, 3, 4, up to as many as you want or an infinite dimensional one that is called the space of square integrable functions that will be defined later. 
we are going to use the Dirac notation for the vectors, which means that a column vector, these are complex numbers, a column vector will be represented in this way with this kind of brackets the, 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 the around. And uh, the corresponding transpose and conjugate vector will be represented in this way. This object is called a ket, and this is called a bra, for the stupid reason that the scalar product is a bracket. And that's how we are going to write all the time the scalar product. Really, there's nothing mysterious in the Dirac uh, notation. It's really, we could use another one, but it's become standard, and you have to learn it. Now, besides vectors, we need operators. We need linear operators, which in the finite dimensional cases are matrices, objects that transform vectors into vectors. And uh, these are the most used ones. Most of the operators that we're going to see are what are called normal operators. Normal operators are such that the eigenvectors form an orthonormal basis of the Hilbert space. Among the normal operators, again, there are some classes that are going to be very useful. The Hermitian operators are those that are equal to their adjoint. The notion of adjoint should be known from uh, basic linear algebra. A, a special case of Hermitian operator are the projectors, the orthogonal projectors. And these are Hermitian operators which, in addition, when you apply them twice, uh, is the same as apply them once. It's called idempotent. The other very important class that will be used are unitary operators. Unitary operators are such that the adjoint is the inverse. These objects correspond to change of basis in a complex Hilbert space. Finally, another very important notion of linear algebra that we've used often is the following statement. Two operators commute if and only if they have a set of common eigenvectors. In this chapter, we also discuss the postulates of quantum mechanics, which means how the mathematical objects of linear algebra are used to describe physical systems. This is the most important piece of translation that you have to learn. And there's no consensus about how to list the postulates. In this course, I've chosen to list them under three headers. The first postulate is about description of the physical system. We've already seen something. We've already seen that the space of states is going to be a vector space. The properties of the physical system will be described as subspaces. What I've not introduced yet is the idea of pure state. A pure state is a state of the system with maximally defined properties. So intuitively should correspond to the smallest possible subspace. And the smallest possible non-trivial subspace is a subspace of dimension 1, therefore a line in this vector space. Now, a line can also be represented by the vector that lies on the line. Therefore, traditionally, we associate pure states with vectors. The second postulate has something to do with measurement, and specifically with ideal measurements. We shall describe carefully in the lectures what ideal means, but here is a model of a measurement. I come with a particle that has a given state. Now, we know a state is a vector, and I want to make a measurement. Making a measurement, which means to find in which of a set of states the particle is found. For instance, here there are possible states A1, A2, and A3. And this measurement makes a click for the state A3. Now, the rules for the measurements are the following. In fact, this is a theorem, but we use it as a postulate, that the probability of finding the outcome AK for a measurement, the state AK as a result of a measurement, is given by the scalar product between the input state and the, that state squared, absolute value. This is called Born's rule and will be used all the time. It's probably the core rule of quantum theory. Now, behind this rule, there is an absence of rule, which is that we postulate that the outcome of a single round of the experiment is unpredictable, in other words, unless the probability is one. In other words, if I send a particle, for that particular particle, I don't know which result will happen. The theory will never tell us what is going to happen to this particle or that particle. The only thing that theory tells us is if you send many particles, all in these states, the statistics of the measurements will be given according to this rule. This is a very important departure 
from classical physics. In classical physics, there is determinism. In principle, I should be able to say what happens to every particle. Here, we really postulate that it's impossible to know what's going to happen to every particle. We can only predict the statistics. The third postulate is about evolution in time. Here we are doing non-relativistic quantum theory. So we have a, the state of a particle at a given time, and we want to know how it evolves at a later time. The postulate is evolution is linear, is described by a linear operator, and is also reversible for closed systems. This is the same as in classical physics. And this implies that uh, the evolution operator is unitary, can be proved. So if I have the initial state at time zero given like that, there will be a unitary operator that propagates the state to time t. The differential version of this equation is the famous Schrodinger equation that says that the change in time of the state is essentially proportional to the action of an operator to the state. This operator is the famous Hamiltonian or Hamilton operator the same generator of evolution that you find in classical physics. So as we see, there are some postulates that are specific to quantum theory, especially these two. The third one is similar to classical physics, but in the context of the quantum description. So we have to change Newton's equation or Maxwell's equations into the Schrodinger equation because we are, we are dealing with these particular vectors that is the way to describe quantum states. With this, we will finish this chapter, and the next three chapters are about specific quantum systems.